Today, as you might be able to tell already, we are continuing with our Heroes of the Faith theme, and we are uh, today exploring one of the Old Testament characters from the book of Genesis, Joseph, one of Jacob's sons, one who was not beloved by his brothers, and one who went on to be God's instrument for saving the whole people of Israel. As we look at Joseph, there are so many characteristics from his life that we could pull out. I want to focus on one specific characteristic that was a turning point for him and not the kind that we would necessarily want. But even God is able to use the difficult things the challenging things. The characteristic I'm going to lift up is integrity. And as we look at integrity, I'm reminded of a uh, young woman who had worked with a financial institution uh, very successfully in their trust department and became so effective at help, helping people plan and invest for their retirement that she decided to go out on her own. And very quickly, her business began to grow and to thrive and mature, and she realized that she needed an attorney on staff with her to navigate through all of the legal field of things involved with that kind of work. And as she is interviewing um, the attorneys, one of the questions she asks is, um, can you give me an example of how you have conducted yourself with a high level of honesty and integrity? And there were a few attorneys who kind of wrestled with that, just like anyone else might. There was one bright, young attorney who, um, when asked that question, oh yeah, you know, I borrowed $15,000 from my father to get through law school, and when I won my very first case, I paid him back in its entirety. She said, well, that's really laudable. Out of curiosity, what was your first case? My father sued me for (laughs) $15,000. Integrity. Standing firm. Being who we are called to be. In the dictionary, it's the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness. I would expand that definition for us to understand that having moral principles and moral uprightness means that we have a code, that we have a standard by which we live our lives. And for Christians, that standard is identified in the scriptures, the parameters are given to us, and we understand what it means for us to live within the boundaries and parameters of that code, that standard, and And Christian integrity is to live our lives in consistency, compliance, adherence to that code of standards around us. As we look at Joseph and integrity, the area of his integrity that came out in this story, and there are other examples, was in the area of sexual integrity. I think that's very salient for our culture today. I think that's a great challenge that we are facing. I pulled some information that I found eye-opening, frightening, and a rather painful indictment of our culture. 64% of young people ages 13 to 24 actively seek out pornography weekly or more often. Teenage girls are significantly more likely to actively seek out porn than women 25 and above. Porn sites receive more regular traffic than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined each month. You know, uh, when I walk up and down the street and see how many Amazon boxes are on people's doorsteps, you know, during the course of the day when I ride my bike and go around, 
And then think about that. At least 30% of all data transferred across the internet is porn related. Those are frightening statistics. Those statistics clearly identify the painful reality that Christians are not living with integrity and adhering to a code and a standard that Joseph exemplified for us. Like money, integrity has to be earned. But unlike money, you can't get it by being dishonest. Integrity comes from being honest. And honesty comes from integrity. I want us to look specifically at the 39th chapter of Genesis and beginning with verse 6. As you're looking that up in your Bibles, I want to give you a little um, back story. This is early in the story of Joseph, obviously, and it is after his brothers, in their frustration with this spoiled brat, have determined to sell him into slavery. He then is sold, taken down to Egypt. He is bought by a man named Potiphar, and he is um, bought. He's one of Pharaoh's officials, captain of the guard, and he was bought to oversee the household. And I want to walk through what this text can teach us, starting in verse uh, 6. In verse 6, so Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. What that means is Joseph was in charge of the household, the property, the crops, the livestock, the whole nine yards. Joseph was the business manager for everything that Potiphar had. In order to work your way into that position, you had to be effective, efficient, and highly trusted. Because you could destroy a person and his family if you so chose. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. So Joseph was a good looking guy. You know, kind of like, you know, most of us. And um, he was a good looking guy. He was attractive to Potiphar's wife because um, we read, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, he would have to work regularly with Potiphar's wife. They would be in the house together. They would be outside together. They would be in constant contact with one another. And what this is clearly saying is she noticed he was hot. Took a good look and she said, come to bed with me. But he refused. Integrity has that first answer. No. He refused. He was given an offer. Potiphar's out doing captain of the guard kind of stuff. He's not home. They didn't have security cameras. They could have slipped off to the side. Come to bed with me. Opportunity presents. Means presents. Everything required for the perfect crime right there. But he refused. No. Several months ago, we had a, um, an event that included counsel, and one of the things we were asked to do was to share something that people would not know about us. And one of the people shared that they um, really enjoyed the Andy Griffith show, and part of their routine was to watch old episodes of Andy Griffith. I have to confess to you that I'm kind of that way with MASH. I've seen those reruns more times than I can count. But sometimes, like on a Sunday afternoon, leaning back in your recliner, a few MASH reruns make for a good nap, and you can keep up with the dialogue because you've had it memorized for 20 years. I love MASH. 
One of the characters I liked in MASH was William Christopher. He was the um, priest, died um, December 31st, 2016. In the show, he comes across as a man of integrity and faith. They exemplified in a number of episodes real life struggles and issues that he had. But what they didn't show in the episode is that there was one episode that was trying to be sold to MASH that was written by a man named Jim Strain. And in the episode, um, Father Mulcahy becomes attracted to a woman and actually wrestles with that whole thing of vacating his vows to follow through on his feelings and his heart and, and, and where his mind and body and who knows what the balance of those two things look like was. And when it came to be read by the executives who would either buy this episode or not, in the end, he stood firm. The temptation was there, but he never acted on it. And the executives wouldn't buy the episode. Because people don't want to see that. They want to see reality. Reality. They want to see him follow through with his feelings and his desires and then deal with the consequences of the problem. They don't want him to stand firm. And Jim Strain would not change the ending of that episode. He stood firm. I think one of the reasons that we at times feel like everybody's out there doing it is because we only hear about the stories where people mess up. We don't hear about all the experiences, moments and times in people's lives where they stand firm and they will not violate that standard or code around themselves of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And when presented with the temptation, refuse. Ultimately, that episode was purchased by the network. And it ended with him standing firm and became one of their more popular episodes. He refused. No, when you are faced with the temptation to violate your Christian code standard, your ethics, your morals, take a word from Joseph. No. Secondly, he explained why not, so that there was understanding between the two. As we were continuing on in the text, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. I'm not going to violate Potiphar's trust. He's given me a pretty good position. I'm a slave, but I've got it pretty good. I've got power. I've got authority. I oversee people around me. I'm well taken care of. And there is a sense of loyalty that I have to him that I will not violate for a brief time of pleasure in bed. He's very clear. I'm not going to do it. So it, it couldn't come back to him as saying, her hearing no, he refused, thinking, well, the timing isn't good, we'll try again. He closed the door. He explained why not, and I should have written further, why not now, never, ever, period. No. Here's why. From Joseph's perspective, what he did was put a barrier, a boundary, this isn't going to happen. Not today, not tomorrow, never. It's not going to happen. I think sometimes, and, and I, sometimes I don't know how to say things right, but, but sometimes I think we're too nice. When we're faced with the temptation, when, when someone's trying to push us into something that we don't want to do, but we do want to do, but we don't want to do, we're too nice, too gentle. 
Remember what Jesus said to Peter at Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi? Get behind me, Satan. I think those are good words. Not going to happen. Get behind me. Draw the clear boundary. Stop. Don't do just the little part. You know, uh, we could go sit on the bed and talk this out. No. Explain it. Cut it off. Clear the boundary. As the text goes on, he avoided the situation. We read, and though he spoke to Joseph day after day, he ref- uh, though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. He wasn't even going to be around her in close proximity with her for any reason because the danger was there. Temptation's real. It takes an incredible level of fortitude to stand in the way of temptation. And he wasn't going to put himself in a place where she would feel motivated to impress herself upon him, and he wasn't going to put himself in a position where he could be too easily tempted. You know, there's a favorite old show that I think many of us have watched, the the show Cheers. How many of you watched Cheers when it was on or even in the reruns? You know, last week we had our family vacation up in Boston, and the seven of us were there, and we toured all over the city. It was a hoot, and I have to tell you, I am so glad we don't have subways here, but that's a whole nother story. Um, One of the places we went was the Cheers Bar, where they filmed Cheers. Have any of you been there? Okay, you walk into the bar and go downstairs. It's not what it looks like. The sign's right. The sign's good. The stairway going down, you get in there, it's too small. Well, upstairs is, I think they call it the filming bar, which was a little bit different. And um, behind that show, the bartender, Ted Danson, um, is tending bar, and he is a recovering alcoholic. He had a career in baseball and as the show unfolds he kind of drank himself out of the career because of a drinking problem he got clean sober and then worked as a bartender in a bar i want you to hear something that only works in sitcoms that stuff doesn't work in real life you have to avoid the situation I think I can say with a high degree of confidence, people who are alcoholics don't go work in bars if they're smart. They avoid the situation. Drug addicts typically don't try to get a job in a pharmacy. They want to stay safe and clean. They have to draw the boundary. Somehow, you have to avoid the situation. If that first statistical sheet I brought up that identified so many things about uh, pornography are there, if that is an issue for you, make sure your computer faces the family. Don't get on it when you're alone. Give the password to everybody in the family. There are programs that you can put on your computers that prevent that stuff from coming in or coming onto your computer. Avoid the situation. When you feel like you're going to be tempted and go do something you shouldn't, go do something you should. Go cut the gra- go walk in the heat. Do whatever you got to do to get your mind in a different place. Avoid the situation with everything you have. Joseph even refused to be with her. But sometimes the situation is aggressive. As we go on in the text, we find that there came a point where he had to run. He literally ran. We read it this way in Genesis 39. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. 
uh oh. He's doing his job. He's in the house, looks around. Uh oh. There's nobody else here. She, Potiphar's wife, caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. He got out of there. Now, I do have to be clear what happens in the rest of the story. You remember that phrase, hell hath no fury, like that of a woman scorned? It might have come from this story. Because this beautiful woman is attracted to this handsome man who continues to refuse her. So finally, she gets the final insult. She's holding his cloak. He's speeding out the door to get away from this situation. And what does she do? Uh, hey, I got his cloak. I can prove something. Pulls a dress down off her shoulder a little bit. You know the whole scene from the movies. And accuses him of accosting her inappropriately. He's thrown into prison. In the short run, it did not end well for Joseph. However, it was in prison when Joseph was given the ability to interpret dreams by God. And Pharaoh had a dream that Joseph interpreted as being seven years of abundance and seven years of um, famine. And Joseph was elevated to be second, not in Potiphar's household after Potiphar, but in all of Egypt, right behind Pharaoh, to oversee all of the people of Egypt, to prepare for the future, and ultimately to prepare for the people of Israel, his own brothers and sister, brothers and family, to come down there, have a place where they had food, and preserve the people of Israel. I think sometimes we have a myopic tunnel vision view. We can only see into the next 10 minutes, 10 days, 10 months. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. God knows. He sees into the distant future. Joseph couldn't have seen 400 years into the future when Moses came and delivered the people of Israel from Pharaoh and began the journey into the promised land. He couldn't have seen that. But God did. And when we are challenged because of our integrity... I think we can have confidence firmly that God has a plan. And our Christian integrity will be rewarded. Integrity is a challenge. We live in a culture that is designed to test integrity. There's a show, I have watched parts of it a couple of times, but it's called Survivor. Is that even still on the air? Anybody know? Oh, you know, you're just not going to tell me out loud, are you? No. Um, there was an episode back in 2005 with a guy named Ian uh, Rosenberger, and he was one of the final contestants, and the final test of this, um, th to narrow it down to the final two, was that these guys had to hang out on um, an ocean buoy, and the last one or two standing would be in the final competition. The last one standing could, could eliminate someone. And he knew in that group who his biggest challenge was, a guy named Ted, who he had become um, friends with over the course of the show. And 12 hours into that, I want you to picture standing up there for 12 hours. That, I mean, that's got to be rough. He's thinking about all the things, because, you know, if he wins a million dollars, I mean, that's a million dollars. There's a lot of stuff you can do with a million dollars. And as he is thinking about it, the path to the million dollars is through destroying a friend. He remembers his scouting. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, 
And he's thinking about the things that they had done together to get to this point and loyalty and his requirement in order to go to the next level of betraying his friend, disloyalty, and kicking him off the show because he had that authority if he outdid it. And began to think about what that meant for him as a person. His code of ethics. His standards. And he decided that every time he went to the ATM to pull money out, every time he lived on an investment, every time he used something that he had bought with it, there'd be that nagging ding on the shoulder that it was not gotten with integrity, with honor, with loyalty, with trust. So he jumped off the buoy into the water. And then he encouraged his friend to kick him off the island because he did not want to be any part of what he realized that show was about. That's integrity. I wonder for people in here, those of us in here today who think and struggle with those moments of integrity, if there are places where we need to jump off the buoy, if there are places where we need to let go and see what God has in store for us, I think we pursue so many things because somehow we think that it brings us the blessing and the privilege, but when it's us going after what we want instead of us going after what God would have us do, be, become, we miss out on the richness and the fullness of the life God intends for us. Where can you grow in your integrity? Is there a place with your sexuality? Those statistics have to include people in this room, people in your neighborhood, people at work, people in your family. They just have to. Where can you individually or help someone grow integrity? Or what about financial integrity? I want to talk specifically about what it means to be a good financial steward of what God has given you. And part of our stewardship as Christians is to recognize the abundance God pours into our lives and to respond out of generosity, giving thanks to God for that which God has wrought in us and provided for us. One of the greatest challenges of the Christian church is financial. What I find intriguing is the Bible sets a standard of a 10% tithe. The average among Lutheran Christians is 1.8. This congregation does much better than that. Depending on how you do the statistics, we're between 3 and 3.5% the last time I looked. That's wonderful. And less than a third of what God asks. God's mission for every church is based on 10%. No wonder we struggle sometimes to fulfill the mission because we're starving it with our own desires instead of trusting in God. What can change financially where we can respond more faithfully with integrity to God for what God has first given us or discipleship? I've come to the understanding in some situations that we would all support discipleship. And we think it's a great thing for someone else. We're really good at identifying all the people around us who would make great disciples if they would just, you know, get it together and do what they're supposed to do. What about you? What about ourselves? We need to quit looking out and look into our own discipleship. 
How are we following God? What are we doing that's making a difference? This congregation's mission is connecting people to Christ. Not what's the congregation doing about that? What are you doing about it? We've given tools and resources. Who's your one? What difference are you making? Recognizing, friends, this is a process. It's not an event. It doesn't happen Tuesday at 3. But what does your integrity look like in discipleship? Stewardship? Sexuality? God is inviting you into a higher life, a better life a more joyful life, a more fulfilling life. A life that's maybe for Ian not burdened with taking care of finances, but light in the heart because of integrity. What step is God calling you to take? Let us pray. Gracious God, We thank you that you have given us incredible opportunity. We may not all be second in Potiphar's household or second in Pharaoh's household, but you have given each one of us opportunity, resources, blessings, richness, love, grace, mercy, forgiveness. You have poured an abundant banquet into our lives. Are we living that life with integrity, Lord? Are we expressing it the way in which we are called to express it? Are we drawing closer to you? Lord, there is a pattern in the Bible that every time we follow our own way, we mess up. And every time we follow you, we are blessed. Are we tired of the pain of the mess ups? And are we looking for the opportunity of the blessing? Turn us to your heart. Lord, we pray for our students and leaders on the mission trip. We pray that each would effectively and passionately reach out to people who don't know you, that they may be serving the mission of this congregation, connecting people to Christ, and we pray that each one of them would grow in their faith. When we help others, we really help ourselves as well. May we revel in this help and in this support. We thank you for the beauty of creation, Lord. And we are reminded that in January when we were complaining about all those bitter cold days that this is what we were looking for. Help us not to complain about this too and want the winter to come back. But to recognize that each season, each day, each temperature, each breeze has its own blessing from a loving and gracious God for us. Remember us in your kingdom, O God, and teach us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.